college football, and more with Scott Moore from iTalk SEC Radio and the Jay Barker Show. And for his weekly appearance, and Scott's going to be with us for a couple of segments. Good morning, Scott. How are you? Hey, Gary. How you doing, man? Good to talk with you. Good to have you on. Before we get to football, let's uh, let's discuss the the huge story, uh, not just in sports, but really um, in news and, and and not just in the country, but around the world. I mean, I think yeah. that uh, uh, Kobe Bryant's passing, while tragic, has certainly uh, illustrated what an iconic figure that he was. Because um, when this started breaking yesterday, I mean, like I said, just worldwide headlines and and uh, professional athletes, coaches. Uh, heads of state, uh, you know, numerous political figures putting out out uh, out statements about about Kobe Bryant, and it is one of those. Uh, and, and and we mourn for the others too. I want to be clear on that. Uh, his oldest yeah. daughter and and the seven other passengers. A lot of lives are are, are affected and and uh, by this tragedy. But for Kobe Bryant, I think it's safe to say that um, now that he's passed, you see that he is a a Muhammad Ali. He is a uh, yeah. you know he is a he is a Babe Ruth. He is a uh, he is a Joe DiMaggio. He is a a iconic figure uh, in the world, and uh, he's going to be missed. Man, I uh, when I got the news yesterday, it was interesting. We we're I'm one of those guys that gets to celebrate my birthday three or four days in a row, yeah, like a lot of people. <laughs> so I had gotten a cake, and Debbie had it was giving me a gift yesterday. She had just give me a gift, and uh, we had just just ex- exchanged little pleasantries there, and then bam, got the news. Uh, and, and actually, I got the news from you. I, the text that you sent was the first I heard about it. And naturally, I uh, we went in and turned the television on, and uh, it was just a state of disbelief and hurt and pain and and all that stuff. Uh, because there's so many things that go with it. There, there. When things like this happen, these are these are events that happen that you will never ever forget. You'll never forget what you were doing or where you were. And and I I told Debbie this yesterday while we were talking about it. It reminds me of when you know you were probably old enough to remember when Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated on television. I remember that and how much it, I was just a kid. And I was like, I can't believe somebody did that. I remember when Martin Luther King was shot, the pain that that caused. Um, when Elvis died, uh, how painful that was for so many people. The world seemed to stop when that happened. And then, you know, Coach Bryant passing away. Um, just the sheer fact that, you know, this was on the same date and, we always go back and think about it. Obviously, the memories have faded throughout the years. I know you talked about that this morning on your show, but uh, and this is this is one of the I, I can't remember uh, in the sports world or, or worldwide a guy that had this kind of impact. Uh, you know, we all knew when 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 Muhammad Ali passed away, he was older. He had Parkinson's, all that stuff. But you know, Kobe was as recognizable a person as anybody on the planet, and. Uh, and what he did and what he stood for from a work ethic standpoint, from a, from a, from just going after it and being a champion, talking about what it takes to get there. He was such a, he was such a great role model for so many people. And, uh, this, this, uh, has just affected, as you said, the entire world is still, it's still hard to believe, uh, right now I've been reading things all morning about it. It's still hard to believe that it happened. And you're right. The other families, they were on board. I mean, this this is a tragedy that's going to affect a lot of people in California, but certainly worldwide too. It's it's just a terrible, terrible thing that happened yesterday. Yeah, and Kobe is a, another example of how you can mature and you can evolve. You know, he was a uh, was an incredible basketball player and a very intelligent human being. We all knew that early on in his career, but he was not always very likable. And uh, even though he and Shaq were teammates, they had their issues. And then, you know, there was the, uh, you know, that that bruising sexual assault case that he emerged from and uh, came out of. And at that time, he was very defensive and defiant and uh, almost very uh, negative uh, toward the media. But he he came through that and uh, then became known, of course, as an incredible family man. He's a renaissance man, as we've talked about this morning already. Won an Oscar, wrote children's books, 
and in retirement was one of those athletes that seamlessly transitioned. And even though I'm sure he missed the competition, he just, he just went right into other things. And, um, you know, kind of reinvented himself uh, from his yeah. earlier playing days and, and became a, a beloved figure. And, and I said this earlier, I remember when he came to Tuscaloosa to meet with the Alabama football team, and I sent a couple of folks over there with cameras. And when they were leaving the building, you know, some of the Alabama football folks were trying to, to whisk him into a car. And he just was like, you could tell it was almost like, oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. You know, and he would say hello and let people shoot video of him and just seem very at ease. So, uh, he really kind of um, reinvented himself during his professional career to become this beloved icon that we know him as today. Well, you, you can't ha- hide talent. And uh, he was phenomenally talented, not only in basketball, but just in everything. He, he's the kind of guy that that uh, could do anything and be successful. At it. Not only be successful, at it, be, be the best of the world in it. You know, so uh, it's, it's really, I mean, again, multifaceted guy. Uh, and, and again, the, the talent that he had from a business standpoint, from a, a marketing standpoint, from, you know, just a, a creative brain, uh, all that stuff. And, the, and then the impact that the impact that he had on uh, on people's lives were, you know, yeah, that was very, very evident yesterday. And uh, and, and, and the, it, it was just it was just painful. It hurt. Um just for a number of reasons, um, but I mean, what we were witnessing and watching yesterday uh, is it, just one of those days in America that you hope that you don't have to go through many more of them in your lifetime. It was, uh, yeah, this is going to be felt for a very, very long time, and and quite frankly, this is just the beginning of this. Going to be a tough week in Los Angeles and in the sports world in general. And I thought too, Gary, watching Tiger Woods uh, get interviewed. Uh, by CBS yesterday, right after he came off the 18th green, when he found out about it, he, you know that that's a guy right there from a worldwide standpoint. I mean, you're you're seeing Tiger Woods being interviewed about Kobe passing away, and that, that's probably in 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 terms of in terms of contemporaries and in terms of your status in the entire world. That, you know, that, that's a guy Tiger Woods that certainly would be on the same plane as uh as kobe and to hear what tiger had to say and, and and looking at his humanism and and realness on the situation and being a, bad, a big basketball fan and all that and just just listening to the raw emotion from him i, I thought that was one of the more compelling interviews we saw yesterday uh from a guy that uh you know if he had passed away too would have had the same impact worldwide as as, uh, as kobe did I thought yesterday there was some some irony uh, in terms of, of this tragic passing. Yep. Saturday night, LeBron passed uh, Kobe for third all time on the NBA scoring list, and one of Kobe's last tweets was a congratulatory congratulatory text to to LeBron, who now of course wears a Lakers uniform. And then yesterday he passed on the same date as you noted uh, that Coach Bryant did, albeit 37 years later, January 26, and they both have the the same last name, Bryant. So I think anybody that's an Alabama football follower or fan or historian, you know, that wasn't lost on us. Scott, I know it right. wasn't on you and it wasn't on me that, that he passed on the same date as Coach Bryant. So there were a lot of a lot of mixed emotions yesterday, I think, for, for sports casters and sports fans that are Alabama fans and Kobe Bryant fans. Yeah, it was. And, and for us that were around uh, when Coach Bryant died, and I know there's a whole generation that's come and gone, but uh, that was the day that uh, you know I was 18 years old when he when he passed away. You're around the same age as me, and when Coach Bryant passed away, it was a day that we thought would never come. I mean, Coach Bryant was one of those people you thought this guy will never die, you know. And and when you're young and you're naive and you're a freshman in college, and uh, you, you just don't expect it. And uh, I just remember uh, the indelible impression that that has left. Uh, on so many Alabamians that that saw it, the funeral procession from Tuscaloosa to Birmingham, the uh, the outpouring worldwide from Coach Bryant as well. You know, heads of state showed up at the funeral in Birmingham. I mean, it, it, it was crazy. Uh, you know, something we've never forgotten the the raw emotion from that as well. You know, the TV reports, just just everything that the the funeral was broadcast. I remember Eli Gold 
uh, was on the radio. I, ta- I taped it, ended up, ended up taping that uh, funeral procession. It was on the radio, and Eli Gold called the action from the funeral procession all the way down. I'll never forget it, from Birmingham to Tuscaloosa. And and then, too, Gary, I think you remember, Alabama played UCLA in basketball that Friday night, and UCLA was the number one ranked team in the country, and Alabama went out to Los Angeles and beat them. And sure did. Crazy, yeah, crazy basketball game that was like, Wow, <laughs> this is just, he just knew it was different. Uh, and so uh, that's, uh, you know, it's been a long time. And, and like I said, a whole generation has passed, but we, we never forget. And the, you know, the, uh, the impact that Coach Bryant had, you know, not only in Alabama, but in college football, but just worldwide brought people together. And I think that's the central thing that, that, that you take from sports is that. You know, yesterday the world was peaceful. You know, it was peaceful because everybody, you know, mourning brings peace sometimes. You know, and it and it brings reflection. And you, you look back and and uh, everybody was kind of one yesterday. And that's the power of sports. Sports brings us all together, and it's extraordinary what the what the what the sports world can do for so many people. And, and when it, and yesterday was just a, a reminder of how painful it can be but also parallels to how great sports can make us feel as well uh, when somebody like Kobe Bryant does what he does and Coach Bryant does what he does. Sports is a wonderful thing. Yeah, and I think it's uh, another example. And again, anytime uh, someone passes uh, in an accident, it's it's tragic for for people that knew them and, and people Absolutely. that love them. And and no death is is, you know, without – hurt and loss but i as you pointed out when there's someone like a kobe bryant or a coach bryant or or uh, a political figure or a sports figure uh, we all feel like we know them to some degree uh right as we do and and the morning is on a, on a lot larger scale and it imp- impacts uh, so many more people and that's what we're dealing with right now i uh i never met kobe bryant the closest i came obviously was when he was here in tuscaloosa if i could have gotten over there to the football building, but I, I wasn't able to, but, you know, was able to send a camera over there and then saw the, the video that we shot and saw how personal he was with, uh, with uh, the, the couple of camera people that we had over there. But I felt like, you know, again, following his career from the time he was, uh, you know, coming out of Philadelphia as a high school phenom and, and, yeah. and drafted by, by uh, uh, Charlotte and, and Jerry West traded for him. Remember Vadi Divac was in the prime of his career and, and Jerry West traded for for Kobe, and and you know the, the the legendary career was in motion. So when someone like that passes, you're right, Scott. It it, it impacts millions of people, and that's why we're discussing it uh, this morning. Hey, we're going to take a break with Scott, and uh, when we come back on the other side, we're going to get into some full fledged uh, uh, football conversation with Alabama. Can LSU keep it rolling now that they've won a national championship, and coaches are leaving, and players are coming out early? That'll be a challenge. So we'll have some college football discussion with Scott Moore from ITalk SEC and the Jay Barker Show as we continue here on the Gary Harris Show on Tide 100.9 FM. Again, uh, there were other lives and families impacted in that tragic helicopter crash yesterday in, in Calabas, California, and one of them was Orange Coast College baseball coach John Altabelli, who I am reading about and obviously was friends with, with Kobe and, and – um, had a, had, had a daughter that was a, a basketball teammate of, of Gianna Bryant and was in that helicopter. And, and reading about him, he impacted a lot of lives and, and a lot of uh, young people and was a respected coach. And, um, um, you know, that's that's tragic as well. And, uh, you know, the, the other people that were on that, that helicopter, um, man, it's just uh, it's just rough. You know, it's about all you can say. You know, how that's going to affect people, you know, moving forward. And uh, I think the one thing, though, the common denominator among all of them is they were great family people. They were great fathers, great mothers. Um, they were taking, you know, they, the purpose of that trip was to go down and and be part of a of a basketball team and and all that stuff. And and uh, you know, both of these guys and, and, and the coach out there with his wife and and and, and other child. Had a major impact for and and what he did, uh, an incredible impact as a coach. He was 56 years old, and, and highly highly thought of uh, a very very colorful great career, and uh, you know it it 
you know, you try to make uh, you try to make sense of it all because these are people that are doing great things. They're having a major impact in the world, and and uh, and we need people like that. We, we need more people like that. Um, that. That's the that's the thing that we we preach on. I know you you do on your show, Gary. I, I know why you do what you do, Gary. You do it to influence people and and uh, and make an impact in people's lives. I mean that microphone that we get behind every day is a powerful tool. And Kobe talked about making an impact, and, and so did that coach. And everybody aboard that plane and, or, or aboard that uh, that helicopter, that was one of their central focuses was impacting other people and making a difference in other people's lives through, through the game of sports and, and teaching and coaching and, and all that. And um, and that's the, that's the important thing is that is that here the next day, is, uh, you know, he, he was a great, great, father that loved his children and loved spending time with them and but he, he making an impact on the basketball court away from the basketball court that was that was the important thing to him and it really it really showed up and that's going to be the legacy that that everybody aboard that uh everybody aboard that that, that helicopter uh, can can say they all made an impact and, and will continue to make one you know for eternity so um but again, the fallout is, uh, is is real, and the pain is is overwhelming. And uh, you know, for the people that are right there, at ground zero of everything, and, and the the next of kin, the relatives, you know, for them trying to to get through this for, from now on is going to be extraordinarily painful and a difficult path. Yeah, Coach uh, Alto, as he was known, also uh, his wife and daughter were aboard that helicopter just to just awful scott college football uh national signing day part two is just nine days away and and all of these sec teams are going to try to shore up their classes with a with a few more for a few more signees and uh Al, you know for alabama it's a, it's a, you know it's work it's work to be done to get back to to the playoff and to get back uh into atlanta for the sec championship game and this is rare that uh, this happens that you come off a season where you don't reach uh, at least part of your goals, and Alabama didn't reach any of them this year. They didn't win the West, they didn't play in Atlanta, they didn't make it into the playoffs, and they didn't play for or win the national championship. So uh, I'm not going to say that Alabama is going to be the underdog. In fact, I think they're going to be picked to win the SEC West next year by most. But still, uh, a little something to prove for this Alabama football team and, and this program under Nick Saban in 2020. You know, it's interesting. Now, I was looking back the last time that an Alabama team, you know, did not win a championship of any kind. And you go back to 2013, and that was the last time that this team, you know, didn't didn't win anything like an SEC West or. And, and we don't even count SEC West titles at Alabama. You, you know, you're talking about SEC titles. You're talking about, you know, a BCS title or, or getting to a bowl game and winning a Sugar Bowl or something. But 2013 was the last time. That an Alabama team, you know, did not. And that team was ranked number one the entire year, was looking for three straight national titles. And what happened post that? Well, post that, you win, uh, you get back to the the first ever playoff, uh, you, you get beat, but you're in a playoff, you win the SEC title, and then you go win the national championship in 2015, and uh, followed up with another national title appearance in 16, and in 17, and 18. So I, I feel like Alabama is is is, is you know kind of getting rewired, uh, reloaded, refocused, if you will. Uh, the amount of juniors that are coming back, there's finally a lot of leadership over there. We, we, there's been great leadership among these talented juniors during this run, but it's great to have some alpha males, alpha dogs on that offense and defense, and you're going to have that this year. Uh, so I think this team's going to have great leadership. It's got a truckload of young talent coming in, guys that can make an immediate impact, especially at the linebacker spot. And uh, so I think this team's going to be really good. I don't care who the quarterback is, Gary. Uh, and that's been saving trademarks in the past. Doesn't matter who the quarterback is. You've got enough talent around you that you can be dominant on the offensive line. You can run it. You can throw it and play great defense. I think this team's going to be able to do that. And I think they can win with whoever's at quarterback, because I think the quarterback uh, room is pretty talented. So uh, I think everybody's ready to get back, get to get this team on the field, finish up with a, uh, with a recruiting class. that has got a couple of pieces out there that are possible right now to make this an even better class. 
And uh, if you get a McKinley Jackson, and maybe a really good defensive back in this class to go with what's already on campus, it's going to be a really interesting summer and fall. The schedule next year is incredibly challenging. But I think one that Alabama fans are looking forward to. Last year, the criticism was everywhere. This year, you get USC and Georgia in the first month of the season, and then a very, very much improved Tennessee team on the road, and then you got to go to LSU and all. And, and Auburn comes here, so it's it's going to be, I think, a great year. Uh, a we- it was a weird season last year. I think everybody's ready to put 2019 behind them and move forward and into a new millennium, into a new age of Alabama football. Well stated. Uh, for LSU, the defending SEC and national champion, uh, incredible year. You know, I mean, they reached the pinnacle, fifteen yep. and zero. Uh, just a phenomenal season. Uh, one of the greatest seasons we've seen in college football history. But now reality sets in, and that is that while this is an unbelievable year, and you've got it uh, in your trophy case, it will never be taken from you. You have to try to follow that up, and you know, with all the juniors that are leaving early, and uh, you lose. Uh, Joe Brady to the to the Carolina Panthers, and you lose Aranda to Baylor, and uh, Ed Orgeron's done a terrific job, but he's going to be challenged, much like you know Alabama was and Clemson was, and and other programs that have kind of come and gone. Uh, it's it's difficult to win a championship. Scott Cook Saban said this: it's it's tough to get to the top. It's even tougher to stay there, and that's the challenge that LSU is going to face in 2020. Yeah, listen, we don't we don't usually use the term rebuild. When uh, when you win a national title for anybody, you look at everybody that's won one in the last decade, and Auburn probably can't, comes to mind quickly. But they were able to rebuild, also go play for a national title in 2013, and and have held their own a little bit over there. But uh, you know, Ed Orgeron's got major challenges ahead. He's got major uh, challenges in the passing offense. He, he lost uh, one of the best defensive coordinators in school history. Uh, a lot of really good analysts that were part of that championship run, but he also lost the best player in school history. We've seen in the past, I don't care what school you are, replacing the best player that's ever stepped on your campus is always a challenge because there is no Joe Burrow on LSU's campus right now, and there's not going to be one in 2020. So, you know, you're you're looking at a rebuild. You're looking at a schedule, too, that's very, very difficult with Texas early on, at Auburn, at Florida, places that, that LSU has struggled in the past. And then also you get Alabama coming to Baton Rouge where Alabama's dominated that series in Baton Rouge for the last 50 years. So LSU's got challenges ahead of it. They're probably going to be picked third in the West, uh, which isn't a bad place to start. But the bottom line, from a talent standpoint, one through 85, they're not going to be what they were last year. Uh, And so Ed's got some expectations to deal with and, uh, and a very challenging schedule. And, and then you take away the key components of one of the best teams ever, and, and there's going to be a drop-off there. And, and plus, everybody in the world is going to be coming after you, including the teams you beat in the SEC West last year. So uh going to be tough. But, but Ed has done a great job recruiting. Um, but these off-season moves that he makes right now with his staff, with his analysts, with everything that he's doing, it's going to be the key to, to see how they can sustain this over the next two or three years. Indeed. Um, when you look at the quarterback situation for the two schools, and both are, are, are losing uh, tremendously talented guys, uh, but you have to assume, based on what we saw from Mac Jones, uh, and unfortunately, you know, Tua going down with the injury uh, gave an opportunity to, to Jones, but, you know, LSU, Burrow was their guy. And, I mean, they played him – uh, they played him deep into just about every game that they played. Um, now both Burrow and, and Tua are gone. Alabama appears to have a much better situation, to me, at quarterback with Mac Jones, and then also, of course, Bryce Young coming in, Paul Tyson, and Talia here as well, than LSU does. Would you agree with that? Uh, listen, I think Alabama's quarterback room right now is the best in the conference. Uh, when you start looking at, at guys that you can count on, talent, uh, you know, very visible, high, you know, high, highly thought of recruits, and, and when you get the the number one recruit in America coming in as a quarterback into your quarterback room to replace a guy like Tua, uh, that that's huge. Uh, the talent is there, the depth is there. Uh, I think we all understand that depth at quarterback. People don't talk about it enough, 
but uh, but the Alabama quarterback depth is, is fantastic. So uh, I, I think Alabama's in phenomenal shape. You, you've got a proven commodity in, in Mac Jones that's had to play. It's a very, very difficult moment, particularly at Auburn. And then beating the Michigan team uh, down in the, in the bowl game, played very, very well there. So uh, he's got great receivers. He's going to have the best offensive line in the SEC to back him up, the best collection of tailbacks. And I think the best collection of wide receivers uh, still in America. And so you put that, uh, all those pieces and elements around a quarterback, and and I think you're going to have some success. So uh, you've had a playmaker at quarterback the last three years. It's, it's been one of the most dynamic players in Alabama history. But Alabama's won titles with serviceable quarterbacks. And here's the good thing. I don't think Mac, Mac Jones would go as a serviceable guy. I think Mac Jones is a difference maker at quarterback. And Bryce Young is absolutely electric, electricity in a bottle. So Alabama is a shape. It's going to be hard to keep. I think uh, it's going to be hard to keep uh, Bryce Young off the field. But Mac Jones, I think, is, uh, is the guy Alabama can win championships with. Right We're eight months out, Scott, obviously, but uh... – just handicap the West real quick as we as we sit here on J- January 27th. Uh, how would you go one through seven? Uh, would you start with Alabama? Would it be Auburn, LSU, A and M? How do you, how do you see it? Just uh, you know, this early, but just a quick synopsis on how you think the West uh, will will look going into the season next year. Well, Alabama's got the least questions uh, and, and the most talent, and and that's that's where you start. So Alabama would be there, and then you go, okay, who can be the second best team in the West? I, I, it was between Auburn and LSU, and both of them have major questions. A and M is going to get some strong consideration this year because the amount of, of talent that they got coming back. You can see A and M making a run this year because of Kellen Mond, their receivers, their young tailback uh, Spiller. So I, I would I would think that A and M is going to get a lot of mention for number two, and, and then you just kind of go down and, and it's kind of a crapshoot. I think Ole Miss will be improved. They got a really good quarterback in John Rice Plumley who can I think I think that, that Lane Kiffin will do some, some fun things with. I think Mike Leach will have an offense at Mississippi State that will throw the football all over the field. They'll probably lead the SEC in passing. I know that sounds crazy, but Mike Leach has done that everywhere he went. And then Arkansas the, is is gonna have a tough time getting back. So that that's kinda how I see the West right now. But to me, Alabama's the clear favorite. Uh, getting Auburn at home, going to a place that they've won consistently in LSU, and then uh, also uh, winning in Knoxville as much as they have over the years. I, I like Alabama's schedule, but 1-85, through 85, again, with a talent that's on the roster right now, Alabama's the most talented team in the SEC. Quick thought on the East. Does it still start with Georgia, in your opinion, or do you think Florida uh, has enough to – to overtake Georgia, at least in the preseason uh, polling that we'll, we'll take later on this summer. How do you see the East? You know, Gary, we were really like four the last year and, and talked about them winning 10 or 11 games again. They got to 11 games. They got Kyle Trask back. He's probably going to be in, in consideration for the all-SEC quarterback in the preseason. They got a lot of pieces on the offensive line. Defensively, I think they're very, very good. They've recruited well. Uh, and, and, and Georgia's got a lot of, uh, a lot of question marks on offense. And coming off a year where they, quite frankly, didn't play all that well. And so uh, you lose Jake Fromm. You got a guy coming in uh, from Wake Forest that uh, that we, we have no idea how he's going to perform in the SEC. So uh, I think with Kyle Trask back, a guy that led them to 11 victories, I think they're going to get the, uh, the preseason uh, bulk of the compliments from everybody. I think they'll be the pick in the SEC East. And, and then I think Tennessee will start the year probably inside the top 20 somewhere, around 16 or 17 with all the guys they got coming back. They're going to have one of the best offensive lines in America. Every starter on Tennessee's offensive front was a four- or five-star recruit. So all of a sudden, they're they're very good up front. They got a uh, Jared Garantano coming back. They got to replace a couple of receivers, but Jeremy's recruited well, and Tennessee's going to be better. We have, can't believe they won six in a row. So I think it's, uh, I think it's Florida, Georgia, and Tennessee – in the East, something we used to see early on when this conference went to divisions back in the ni- early early nineties. Long time, well, it seems like a long time. College football season I actually be here before you know it. No, plenty of time to 
discuss these Wait. topics going further, but just wanted to, to pick your brain here uh, in late January on how you think it will, will play out. I know coming up on the Jay Barker show today and on I Talk SEC, a lot more uh, sports discussion, including more on, on Kobe. What, uh, what do you got on tap? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to give their thoughts and opinions about it, and 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 I'm really uh, we're, we're going to really get heavy in the basketball. I can't can't wait to see uh, you know Alabama traveling to Baton Rouge this week in a key game in basketball. Uh, you know, if Alabama could get that win, that would be absolutely a, a monster win for them. And uh, but this the schedule shaping up for the Tide in basketball right now is very very favorable. It's difficult, but it's also favorable. So uh, you got a chance to to make your season over the next uh, four or five games. And this trip to Baton Rouge is going to be kind of a cornerstone. You know, Nate Oates has talked about winning a big game on the road. Winning at Vanderbilt's one thing. Winning at Baton Rouge is a totally different animal. So uh, we'll, we'll see how Alabama does this week. But this is an important week for the SEC in basketball. And Gary, looking forward to to seeing what shakes out. Big win for Alabama over Kansas State on Saturday in the Big 12 SEC Challenge. SEC and Big 12 went 5-5 five and five against each other. Also, a big win for the Alabama women uh, yesterday. They had some tough losses. They blew out Vanderbilt on Sunday at home. Thanks a lot, Scott. Thank you, Gary. Thoroughly enjoyed it, buddy.